on to um, favorite session of uh, council initiated discussion. And again, orientation for the new council members. Up until this point, and we're at uh, 422, the agenda has been controlled by NHGRI. We brought to you the things that we think are important or relevant or the business that needs to be done. Uh, but now we're turning the control of the microphones back over to you. And uh, if there are reports that, looking ahead to future council meetings, if there are reports that you would like to have on specific programs, if there are important issues that you've heard brewing in your um, institutions or at national meetings that you want to bring to our attention, uh, if you have ideas about uh, new initiatives that uh, could be considered. I think we've told the story before, but the origin of the SEGS, the Centers of Excellence in Genomic Science, actually came out of a council-initiated discussion a, a dozen years ago. So we're turning the microphones over to you, and we're all ears. And I deal very well with awkward silence. Any topics you want to hear about at upcoming meetings? I think at May Council, we currently have slated a presentation by the new director of National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, correct? I don't think we have a, uh, locked in the date, but that was on think, our list of things it's, to do. I think yeah. you locked in. Okay. Um, so, Eric, in your, in your report this morning, the, you gave updates on a lot of great stuff, but we didn't get an update on the search for the NLM. Director, can we get an update on that? Um, I only give you an update by saying that the search process is still ongoing. Um, so I think, you know, it's at a, it's getting at a late stage, certainly. Um, but, but the person has not been identified. I believe interviews are still going on. I would hope that individual would, you know, I'm hoping that you would, that, that that individual would be identified by the next council meeting, if not before. But as always, it requires, you know, all things to, sort of work their way through, selections be made, and appropriate due diligence done, and acceptances, and negotiations, and all the usual things. So it's, I mean, it's being put, you know, that and the head of the precision medicine program, I think, are two very high priorities. I would also tell you, there are, it's a very busy search time. They're searching for a new head of the Child Health Institute, a new head of the Mental Health Institute, um, uh, at least one or two other searches, I know. So it's, it's a busy time for, for NIH leadership to be conducting searches, but I know that NLM director is further along than almost any of them. I think um, uh, certainly once that person is identified and the director for the, the PMI is identified, it'd be great if we could hear from them. Oh, no. At, at, yeah, that's an easy one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and in the minutes from the last meeting, we had um, talked about having additional presentations from FDA. Um, yep. Bob Kalis? Yeah, Rob Kalis. So we, and I, I, we saw that, Rudy and I were reviewing that. Uh, the, the issue with Rob is that um, he's been nominated to be the commissioner, and uh, that is trying to percolate its way through the Senate with some potential obstacles. That maybe it would be an awkward to ask him to do this at this juncture, so we haven't yet. Um, and, you know, we'll see if he's ever confirmed. Obviously, you know, there's time running out on the Obama administration and, and how many more things the Senate is going to approve. Um, in terms of nominations. But yes, I agree that would be awesomely valuable. There's a, I mean, I can tell you, and maybe you already know, there's a lot of issues and a lot of interactions we're having with the FDA. And it's having, there's lots of topics. We brought people from the FDA here to a council meeting, and that was very helpful. Returning to that would be terrific. I think just the timing has to be right. It has to be the right person right now. It's a little awkward. Maybe by May it would be better, but it's on the list. But we agree. Hi, this is Jay. Hi, Jay. What's up? How are you doing? I've been uh, silent but listening. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, it's a good time, I wanted to bring um, something up that uh, I think we talked about two weeks ago, uh, but, but I think I, I forgot to bring it up, and I think it just came up at the last count, um, which was the length of investigator-initiated R01, um, the current app possible readdressing of that. Um, if, I, if I remember from the discussion that we had two, council ago, two councils ago, there was general feeling that this was a legacy of 
um, caps that were imposed by council during the early days of the demonstration project, and somehow it's not been revisited. And could be wrong about that, but that was what we were remembering. Um, and yeah, just the more I thought about it, it really seems like a, something that I think could be brought up again and um, discussed. I think I followed most of that, although it was, you were chopping a little bit on and off. Um, I'm going to look to Jeff and Terry or anybody else to help me with this, but under the general discussion of history of why we limit lengths of RO1s in an automated fashion the way Jay alleged and what was the, the reasons why we continue to do it, do you want me to... Wait, 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 the, I mean, I mean, I, one, of the, one of the immediate things, I mean, I, let me start, but I do want somebody else to come to the microphone. I mean, one of the immediate reasons that we have tended to do that was with the general attitude that genomics, unlike many other areas of science that NIH supports, is moving very quickly and there's many developments happening and that it seems that... Uh, having things on relatively shorter leashes than compared to longer leashes gives us greater chance to make sure that we are capitalizing on new advances. And so the ideas in general are we have kept our grants a little shorter. Um, um, and, and certainly once the budgets got to be tight, I think that was another reason to keep things on a short leash with great uncertainty. But Jeff, what, you want to expand on that, or that's basically the rationale? There, there's not a lot to add, but that has been advice from council over a number of years. Uh, I'm not sure that we've explicitly discussed it at council for the last five years, but when we've mentioned it, we haven't heard much alternate opinion. So, uh, but that doesn't mean we couldn't discuss it, discuss it at council. We have to understand what the implications are either way, right? And we tend to give longer grants to younger investigators to give a break there, and then we tend to give a little bit shorter. Um, and then we certainly tend to keep our major programs on something like a four-year cycle as opposed to five-year cycle again because the science just gets turned upside down so many times every four years. So that's the rationale, Jay. I, and I think we did briefly, I remember a couple of councils ago we briefly touched on this as a topic area, but I guess the question is, take the, you know, what do people think? I mean, we have sort of gotten comfortable into that mode, and is there a serious opposition to it, or is there, people agree with this general rationale? Well, I mean, I think I get, it, it would be good to hear how, it, uh, what damage it's doing. If, if that seems to be an indication is that there's a problem with that. Uh, it's not a policy, it's a practice. So I, I was just going to ask, do you know what the stats are on typical lengths? Median lengths or, or the cap? Length you mean cap? stats across NIH? No, no, and oh. an NHGRI for investigator driven. So I think it's a good idea to defer this to May, but for just in fairness to Jay, because Jay, we really are having a very difficult time understanding you, and maybe there's uh, something to be said to bringing some data to the council. Then it gives you guys a chance to think about this and tell us why it's no longer appropriate to. Have the, I think the majority of our R01s are three years, and so what what harm that may be causing, or what could be, what would be the benefit to extending that length? But let's do this in May, when Jay will be in the room. Uh, actually, well, it's, it's, it's that, that it's true. Our R01s are generally uh, three years. For certain programs, we make the R21 three years, which is actually longer than many filler R01s, uh, because we think some of the. Uh, uh, research topics are super challenging and it's really hard, particularly with smaller amounts of money, to make the amount of progress you're going to need in order to have the data you'll need for an R01 application. So we've gone both ways, but again, those are smaller amounts of money. So Jay, uh, and, and you're mostly focusing on R01s, right? Investigator-initiated R01s? Focusing on R01s. Okay. So, so I, I agree with Rudy, so let's do that, and we already heard a request for some data, so we will bring you a more informed set of information to have that discussion at the next council meeting. That sounds good. I, I think it'd be helpful for comparison to have equivalent kind of just information on, on the, on the non-investigator initiated awards and what their length are. Like, are, are the R01 significantly shorter than everything else? Um, 
because that that's, would seem to be like an incongruency to me. But. Okay. Other topics either to discuss now or to put on the agenda for future meetings? Okay. Back to you, Rudy. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. A couple more things need to be done in open session. Uh, next up is the uh, review of the statement of understanding. Um, it's just a matter of time before I refer to this as the MOU Memorandum of Understanding. So if I say MOU, I refer to the statement, and I apologize for that. The statement of understanding is a description of how we will conduct business between NHGRI and the council. We do this every February. We need you guys to approve the SVMOU. There I go already. Um, and we do this in February because the new council members are here. So uh, I'm not going to, it's a four-page document. I do encourage you to read through it. It's pretty uh, plain and simple language. I'm just going to race through the ba basic principles right now. Uh, what's outlined in the Statement of Understanding is uh, the responsibilities of council and a description of the, act of the actions that council can take. Um, and there's also a description of the administrative authorities that NHGRI staff has, and that means the things that we can do without council approval or bringing it to your attention. So uh, every application that is submitted and, re and go undergoes peer review each round must undergo a second level of review at the council meeting. Um, we put many applications on the closed session agenda, and we will discuss those when we get into closed session. But there are many more applications that we don't put forward um, because um, the we assume the review was appropriate and um, we know what to do with those applications. We don't need your input and we're not required to bring them to your attention. Okay. So um, there is an activity that goes on called the on-block vote. That will happen at the end of the second day of council. And all the other applications that were in for review are approved by you in the on-block vote. Now, uh, at least the full standing members of the council have access to all of the summary statements for all of the applications. Um, as you go through them, if you see an application that is not on the CSA that you want to have discussed, you need to bring that to our attention and, and we will readily do that for you. Council can take four actions. You can concur with the IRG. You can defer the application with the belief that it received an inappropriate review. You're essentially sending it back to be re-reviewed. You can vote the application as either having high program priority or low program priority. Or you can defer the application not because it received a poor review, but because you need more information to do your second level of review. Those are the four things that council can do. Um, the staff has the authority uh, to, uh, and, and we do, implement something called expedited council uh, concurrence, ECC. There are four council members that serve on the ECC subcommittee. It's uh, Bob, Gail, Brent, and Jay Shanduri. Uh, about a month before each council meeting, they receive a list of applications uh, for the current round. They tend to be from programs that have set aside, so SBIRs, STPRs, uh, many of the LC applications, the uh, uh, investigator-initiated applications, are put on the ECC. The subcommittee reviews them and gives approval for those. Again, any council member can look at the list, ask for those ap any of those applications to receive a full review at the meeting. Why do we do this? We do this to try to spread the work for the grants management staff they're going to get hit with a bolus of activity after the on-block vote tomorrow. If we can start some of the award-making process upstream, uh, and again, from set aside, so we don't think that these are particularly contentious discussions. That's what the ECC is about. You will get a report in, in, in the electronic council book of the ECC actions for this round, so that even those of you that are not on the subcommittee can see everything that's going through. Uh, staff has authority to make supplements to existing uh, grants. Uh, the limits of those uh, supplements are $150,000. Uh, 
or 25 percent of the total award amount, whichever is greater. In the case of very large grants, and we do have some, such as the sequencing centers, we're capped at a million dollars uh, for a supplement request. So anything outside of those limits have to come to Council. Again, there is a report in the Electronic Council book of all the supplements that have been made by the staff in the last round, so you can see what's there. Uh, and finally, in the event of a catastrophic act of nature, or like um, inch of snow in the DC like area, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, like that, which or is a of snow. or a prediction of snow, exactly. Um, we have the authority to stage the council meeting in an electronic format, whether that would be a telephone call or uh, a big email exchange or WebEx, something like that. So it's a four-page document. I encourage you to read it, um, but I do need you to approve uh, the, the statement of understanding uh, as a as a thing. So. I have a motion to accept. A second. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, the conflict of interest statement. All right. My favorite part of the council meeting. I'm going to read. The, I'm going to read the chant before before I retire. I hope to have this memorized. You must leave the. Uh, now this refers to all the applications that will review be reviewed in the closed session. You must leave the meeting room when applications submitted by your own organization are being individually discussed. In the case of state higher education or other systems with multiple campuses geographically separated, quote unquote, own organization is intended to mean the entire system, except where a determination has been made that the components are separate organizations for the purpose of determining conflict of interest. You should avoid situations that could give rise to charges of conflict of interest, whether real or apparent. For example, you should not participate in the deliberations and actions on any application from or involving your spouse, your child, a recent student, a recent teacher, professional collaborator with whom you have worked closely, a close personal friend, or a scientist with whom you've had long-standing scientific or personal differences. The NHGRI staff will determine the appropriate action based on recency, frequency, and strength of such associations or interest, either positive or negative, and will instruct you accordingly. In council act actions in which your vote on a block of applications without having any discussion on any individual one, the so-called on-block vote, your vote will not apply to any application from an institution fulfilling the criteria noted above. Uh, please sign the conflict of interest and disposal of confidential materials forms, which are provided in the envelope uh, at your chair, and they'll be collected at the end of the closed session. Okay. So we have um, one other uh, action that is not on the agenda. Do you want to raise it, Chris? Yeah. I do. So the normal rotation for council members is that uh, after serving four years, they would rotate off at the September meeting, and then the new council members come on board in the February meeting. Well, there are always exceptions to the rule, and if you need a definition of an exception to the rule, we offer Jim Evans as a <laughs> shining example of that. All kinds of exceptions. If you need to have proof that he's a unique kind of person, ask him after the open session is adjourned to show you his DNA tattoo. Um, that wasn't a joke, actually. That is not was, a joke. Being serious. <laughs> and it is not a temporary tattoo, either. Um, on a more serious note, uh, Jim has been an incredibly valuable advisor. He was not available last September, so we imposed on him to come back for the February meeting. Um, you've been a, an incredibly valuable advisor, uh, largely because uh, you've been an early adopter of clinical sequencing. Uh, you've also embraced uh, the value and the concept of embedding LC research in a clinical sequencing center, um, and um, you've been an important proponent of that. At the same time, um, I will tell you that many times in the middle of discussions and debates between the left side and the right side, genomic science and genomic med medicine, I have heard Jim speak out and say, you can't forget about the importance of the basic science component here, that understanding function is critically important to really be able to garner all of the important 
uh, clinical utility that we get out of these variants that are found associated with specific diseases. So, um, Jim, I've always found you to be a very balanced person, um, and um, uh, we're, we're really grateful for your time and effort that you've given to us. So we thank you. Uh, we will miss you, and we wish you the very best. We have some lovely parting gifts. We haven't quite perfected the home version of the council game. <laughs> that was a joke. I, I really appreciate it. I'm thinking this probably is not a bottle of scotch, even though it's the right size. But, no, this um, is the government. <laughs> but I, that's right. But I, I, it's been a, an absolute honor and a privilege to, to get to serve on council. It's, I do have a lot of colleagues on various councils who they just take it as a matter of course with other institutes that you're a rubber stamp. And um, I definitely don't feel that that's the case here. So. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, I, it's just too bad that I finally feel like I'm getting the swing of it, um, and and that uh, it's my last council. But thank you. And with that, you can gavel us to closure. Um, I will gavel us to closure, and let's go through now what we're going to do. So, you want me to do this? So, sure. There, um, so we're done for the day, uh, except for council. We're going to this council meeting. Um, I'm going to have two executive sessions with the council. Staff doesn't necessarily um, know about all the details, but I'm going to have a one right now as soon as we can clear the room, in essence, and then my usual one tomorrow at lunch. So I would propose we take about a 15-minute break. It gives the AV folks a chance to clear these cameras and, and so they can go home, give staff a chance to clear out of the room and they can go home. But council, you can have a 15-minute breather, but then come back here and we'll have our the one a couple things we want you to talk about in executive session tonight and then... How are we going to handle tomorrow? Well, I need an addendum to that. Yes. <laughs> we need, because of the availability of phone reviewers, we actually, we're going to uh, tear down the cameras here, come back into closed session. We're going to do the LC Sears. Oh, I'm sorry. Review. We're doing one thing today. We're doing oh, one I'm thing sorry. today because that. of the availability of phone reviewers. Oh, so people Then we'll clear the room and you Got can it. have your executive session. I forgot session. about that. I'm sorry. Okay. And when we get into closed session, I'll have an announcement for the staff about a catastrophic snowstorm. Coming our way. Right. Okay. Right. So we're going to break for 15 minutes. Right. Got it. Sorry.